I'm treading the path of pilgrims. Hundreds of thousands have passed through these long winding alleys. They've done this for the last 700 years. I'm walking to the grave of the great Sufi master, Hazrat Nizamuddin Aulia. I'm headed towards the main courtyard. I've just passed stalls and stalls of flower sellers. The air is thick with the heady scent of roses. It seems even the mosquitoes are determined to pay homage to the Sufi master. Tonight is a very special night and it's open house for groups of Qawwali musicians from all over India and Pakistan. Qawwali is the devotional music of the Sufis. It flourishes in Pakistan, but the story begins here at Nizamuddin in Delhi, the cradle of classical Qawwali. Nizamuddin lived and worked right here in the 13th century and it was from here he guided thousands through the mystical way of life. The high point of tonight's music is a special Qawwali sitting by the Nizami Qawwals to celebrate the death anniversary of the great master. It may seem a bit strange that they're celebrating a death, but for the mystic, death means an eternal reunion with the creator. So, for a Sufi, the day you die is the day you really live. Kunto Mola, the world's oldest Qawwali in praise of Hazrat Ali, son-in-law of the Prophet of Islam. All Sufis think of him as the original Sufi. The Prophet Muhammad says, if you accept me as your master, then Ali too is your master.
Hukum Tomola was composed by Amir Khusro in the 13th century. Khusro was Nizamuddin's favorite disciple. He was from Turkish and Persian origins and was one of the most influential personalities in the spread of Sufism in India. I'm joined now by Salim Kedwai, a professor of Indian history. Salim, how did Sufism come to India? Well, the Sufism appeared along with the Turkish Muslim warriors when they invaded North India. And it seems that it was the Sufis who created the Islamic empire in terms of creating acceptance of Muslim rulers rather than the military successes of these generals. The Sufis spread very far and wide in North India, at least in the initial century, that is the 13th century. And uh, they seem to have been the human face of Islam in North India. And this is why Islam that, has, that spread in India was the, the Sufi rather than the orthodox version of Islam. So what would you say is at the core of Sufism? What, what does a Sufi actually believe? Like all mysticism, this is a inner quest. It is a search for enlightenment, for some sort of knowledge of the divine. And the thing that was crucial for the spread of Sufism in India was the relationship between the disciple and the master, the peer and the murid, and the appointment of former disciples as subsequent khalifas or deputies who then were allotted different territories to spread their message. And it was like a chain that within five decades had covered all of Punjab, Rajasthan, northern India. So we're sitting at the shrine of uh, one such uh, master and disciple, one of the greatest masters of the Chishtia order. Can you tell us something about the master Nizamuddin Olia and his favorite disciple, the poet musician Amir Khusro? Nizamuddin was one of the last of the great Chishtis. Nizamuddin, who died at least in the early part of the 14th century, was in a way the epitome of the success of the Chishti order. The Chishtis by Nizamuddin's time were a force to be reckoned with in terms of the power they exerted over the minds and the hearts of people, not just Muslims, which was done through various methods, through patronage, charity, free food, through very extensive musical sessions. And a thing that needs to be pointed out that in the days of the Sultanate, which is essentially a very politically unstable period, it was the Chishtis who patronized music, it was the Chishtis who patronized poetry and prose writing, it was the Chishtis who patronized other forms of arts, not the Sultans of Delhi. So in a way, the Chishti school was far more permanent as a presence in uh, North Indian society than the various Sultans who came and went with alarming frequency. Um, Amir Khosro clearly is a landmark in terms of being an exceptionally gifted person, a linguist, musician, courtier, eulogist. But what he clearly has meant to Indian society is his role as a cultural metaphor for this period. So how is Sheikh Nizamuddin himself uh, connected to music? Like all other Chishti saints, Nizamuddin was a believer in music as a method of introducing a trance-like state of a means of getting closer to the divine truth. Of course, this was problematic because the orthodoxy viewed this with great deal of suspicion. But all Chistis, particularly Nizamuddin, uh, were known for using music as a meditative exercise. Uh, Salim, does, uh, does Qawwali take on a, a different meaning when it, when it takes place here, right here in its context where it began? Definitely. The same Qawwal that we hear elsewhere don't sound the same because the focus of the Qawwali is the, the saint himself. The atmosphere is real, unlike auditoriums or private gatherings. Here one hears the original repertoire, one does not hear modern day interpolations. The best Kavali that you can hear anywhere in the country is always around the shrines. And this is one of the premier ones.
छाप तिलक सब छीनी रे मुँह से नैना मिलाई के आर आईज मेट इन ऑल माई मेकअप my finery came to nothing as your eyes met mine the image in this song is that of a young love smitten woman who has been stakingly made herself more beautiful for a meeting with her beloved but when she comes face to face with him her fine clothes are crushed her jewelry is in disarray and her makeup smudged this is one of khusro's most erotic hindi poems it refers to the dishevelment that is inevitable during love making The essential Sufi message is that however much we adorn ourselves in the end when we stand before God it all comes to nothing in the ecstasy of union <laughs> Sula 
Kabbals are the official resident musicians at this shrine, the highest place a family of Sufi musicians can hold. The family has lived here since the days of Nizamuddin. They live in a sort of a cellar that used to be the master's kitchen, and it was from here that the master's followers cooked vast quantities of food for the poor. And they're still doing it today. There are several large cooking pots out here, bubbling away with the meat korma to feed just about anyone who happens to be passing by. We've been invited to dinner and to the very special privilege of a private recital. The musicians have promised to sing for me some of their top secret private repertoire of ancient Qawwalis.
ارے جدلی امجد سرکا حضرت نظام الدین علیہ رحمت اللہ علیہ کے ہاتھ پر بیت ہوئے یعنی مرید ہوئے تو ہمارے ازداد میں خلیفہ بھی تھے آپ کے ہمارے دادا پردادوں میں سے ون اف آئی انسسٹرز واز اسپیشل ڈسائپل آف حضرت نظام الدین اولیاء اینڈ وی بلونگ ٹو اے فیملی آف میوزیشنس وی آر نیچرلی گفٹڈ ان میوزک اٹس گاڈس گفٹ ٹو اس مائی اینسسٹرز سرو ماسٹر نظام الدین دے سینگ فار ہم امیر خسرو واز آلسو اراؤنڈ ایٹ دیٹ ٹائم ہی ٹو بیکیم اے ڈسائپل Music was spiritual food for Nizamuddin Aulia. He would not eat until he first listened to a kawali. One day, he asked Khusro to farm a group of singers. He said, a chorus would be better. Our ancestors were pioneers of that first group. They were really men of God. They knew nothing of the worldliness. They were simple. They just repeated the name of Allah and they served their master. They taught their children that music was an act of worship. That's how we were all taught. But Allah's name was mentioned in such a way that they would lose themselves in it. Sometimes they would go into a trance. When this happened, the master would turn all his grace on them. And sometimes he would just call them over and embrace them. So why would you not sing any of this outside in the main courtyard? Look, we give you this private stuff because of your love for us. Our elders only gave permission to sing these things for those who love us and what we stand for. And you have come for radio all the way from England. Jamila ji, listen. Jamila ji. آلے نبی و سلاوات اللہ و سلام علیہ آلہی اب اس کی جو لفظ ہم کچھ چھپا جاتے ہیں We gobble the words on purpose People try to catch us out Big men with big houses But we are poor This is our only treasure Only when people understand the truth of this message Can they follow the words Otherwise, even if they hear the words It won't make any sense to them وہ سننے کے بعد بھی نہیں لکھ سکتے that pass through this shrine each year, it is said no one ever goes back empty-handed. Childless women beseech the spirit of the master to bless them with children. Teenagers pray for success in exams. Others just feel a strong pull towards the master. Nizamuddin was a Muslim, but his followers come from different religious traditions, Christian, Sikh and Hindu. My name is Moti Daryanani. I'm a politician with the Congress I. And I have my own family business. Can I ask you about your personal spiritual links with the uh, shrine of Hazrat Nizamuddin Ali? Uh, I must say that this has been quite recent, uh, over a year and a half, and I was introduced. Uh, but even before this, even the practice of Hinduism in my house has always been that God is formless. So it's very easy. You walk into the shrine uh, without anything uh, to block you, you know. Uh, the Kavali itself is like a vehicle which draws you to that power. It uh, tickles your finer senses and you suddenly try to break away from everything and naturally if you let go you get 
drawn into it and you start rising. And it doesn't have to be a Muslim or a Hindu or a Christian or anything. It's just, I personally feel if you are really drawn to it as selfless being, um, you really will enjoy the, the moments of your life that you're here. My name is Abdul Muttalib Patel and I came from Bombay, especially from Bombay. My name is Abdul Muttalib Patel from Bombay and I have the good honor of coming to the shrine of Peer Nizabuddin Aulia. This isn't the kind of shrine to which you decide to come. It is the Peer's love that pulls you to the shrine. It's a spiritual pull and uh, I'm lucky to be here. What do you gain from Qawwali? What, what does Qawwali do for you personally? It's a blessing from Hazrat Amir Khusro that Qawwali has come and is spread worldwide and its story begins here. And Qawwali is really a message. It's a message that preaches to anyone who is willing to understand it. Today it is Nizamuddin's celebrations. It is his blessing that Qawwali is still alive in the world. I have been coming here for two years and when I first started coming here I was in a lot of trouble and I just came here and I cried as a child cries when it comes home to its mother after a long separation. When I listen to Kavali, I just don't want it to stop. I could listen to it forever. I seem to lose my senses, and while I listen to Kavali, I feel that Master Nizamuddin himself is standing before me. started the final song. Qawwali recitals always end with rang, which literally means color. The disciple wishes to be painted in the image of the master. Khusro composed rang to celebrate the time when Nizamuddin finally accepted him as a disciple. 700 years on, Khusro's sheer exuberance still brings tears of joy. Once again, the imagery is powerfully sexual. Oh Khusro, the wedding night is here at last, 
and I'm going to stay up all night with my beloved. My body, his spirit, enmeshed in the same hue of color. Dye me, O oh master, dye me the same color as you. Sarva Simila, Vasera Mila, 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 Vasera